So, if we consider a slow movement of the plunger, so the plunger moves from its open position, which is shown here in figure 3.10a. So, the plunger is in open position and it goes to its closed position, which is shown here in figure 3.10b. So, if you assume that the motion from the open position to the closed position is extremely slow, so in that case, what would happen is that the rate of change of flux by the linked by the coil would be extremely small and hence d lambda by dt would tend to be zero so if d lambda by dt tends to zero as shown in equation 3.27 the current flowing through the coils will not change okay so whatever current was flowing through the plunger in the open position same magnitude of current would flow through the plunger in the closed position and if we look at the motion very carefully it's shown here in this page uh, so if you look at equation 3. Point, uh, sorry figure 3.12 very carefully then we would see that in the open uh, in the closed position the inductance is something around 4.8 uh, milli Henry and in the open position the inductance is around 1.2 milli Henry and if we look at the lambda versus I curve the blue curve shows the lambda versus I curve for the open position and the red curve shows the lambda versus I curve for the closed position so initially let's say a current of 8 ampere was flowing through the coil when the plunger was in open position a current of 8 ampere went through the coil and when we very very slowly move the plunger and bring it to the closed position the current will not change and once the current does not change so we can see that once the plunger is completely closed our operating point moves from A to B because the current remains same so from uh, the point 8 ampere we draw a line parallel to the y axis which is the lambda axis and we see where does it intersect the red line and it intersects the red line at point number B. So this point B is our operating point, a constant current operation. Now the question is we have to find out how much is the force produced okay? or how much is the force that acts on the plunger and the force that acts on the plunger can be determined by first finding out how much is the field energy stored in the system. So the field energy stored in the system is actually shown in figure 3.14 which is the shaded area. So the shaded area that we see here is the field energy stored inside the system uh, once the plunger moves from the open position to the closed position and this is given by equation 3.29 Okay, the shaded area is actually given by area O, B, D, F, O. So it is O and then we have B, D, F, O minus the area O, A, D, O. O, A and then we have D, O. So the subtraction of these two areas, the difference of these two area give us the field energy which is stored inside the system. And the input electrical energy would be I into D lambda, my current remained constant. So when my plunger was in open position, my flux linkage was lambda 1 and when my plunger was in closed position, the flux linkage was lambda 2. So the electrical energy is given by equation 3.30 I1 lambda 2 minus lambda 1. And this is also represented in terms of area. The input electrical energy is area A, B, C, F, D which is shown over here. Okay, so it is A, B and then we have C, F, D. So that is the input electrical energy. So if I am sure it's difficult to explain everything in this short webinar, but I am, I'll try to cover up as much ground as possible. So we have identified the area for the stored energy. We have identified the area for the input electrical energy. And we know that input electrical energy is equal to field energy plus mechanical energy. So we substitute all the area and hence we find out that my mechanical energy is the combination of these areas as shown in equation 3.33. So my mechanical energy is actually equal to area OABCO. So let's go back to the figure OA 
BCO. So this small area that I have is actually my stored mechanical is my mechanical energy. The area enclosed between the two curves and between the uh, line connecting the two operating points. So the line connecting the two operating points is between A and B. So that line and then the sections of the blue line and the red line. So whatever we see here is the mechanical work that is being done on the plunger. Now, well here we have an example to explain all that. So I think we will not go through the example. Maybe we can organize one more webinar if you are interested to discuss all these examples in detail. But we will proceed further and we will go to instantaneous motion. So if we go to instantaneous motion, here we assume that the plunger was in open position and instantaneously extreme fast motion of the plunger takes place and it goes to the closed position. So if the plunger moves almost instantaneously, that means the time taken to move the plunger from open position to closed position is equal to, uh, is almost equal to zero, then in that case what would happen is our flux linkage will not change, okay? Because the system has an inductance and due to the inductance the flux cannot change immediately. It takes time, it needs time. So in case of instantaneous motion our flux will not change immediately and as a result of that if we see Initially, our operating point was at A. That means a current I was was I one was flowing through the coil, and corresponding to that I one, if we look from the blue curve, the flux linkage was lambda one. And once I instantaneously move the plunger, my flux linkage remains at lambda one, and we see that the current actually decreases drastically, and it's something I two which we can figure out from this figure. So initially in the open position my operating point was A and when I suddenly move the plunger my operating point becomes B and if I leave my plunger long enough at point B the current would eventually rise and it would come to the magnitude I1 because in steady state the change in the flux would have died down and eventually we just have a coil with certain resistance so the steady state current would be given by the input voltage divided by the resistance of the coil. We have not changed the resistance of the coil. It's only during the motion that we had changed the inductance, but eventually in steady state, the change in the inductance would die down and we would eventually have current I1 and that is shown by point C over here. So, a, so an instantaneous motion actually is a motion where the flux remains constant and the current decreases drastically. And just like in the previous case, we can find out the shaded area and this shaded area would give us the work done on the plunger. Okay? And here there is something interesting to note, which is the electrical input energy. So electrical input energy is I into D lambda, okay? Integral of I with respect to lambda from lambda 1 to lambda 2. Now, since we had an instantaneous motion, there was no change in lambda. So lambda 2 minus lambda 1 is equal to 0. Hence, my input electrical energy is equal to 0. So here we can say that the entire mechanical work that is done is due to the field energy. That means once we had a sudden motion of the plunger, the stored field energy in the system was converted into mechanical energy and resulted in the force acting on the plunger. And hence, at the end of the motion at point B, the energy stored, the field energy stored in the system is small compared to the field energy stored uh, in the open position. So an instantaneous motion results in decrease in the stored field energy. And that is what is being de depicted here. And this is also something very similar to the case that we have seen without the motion uh, when we had a rheostat. So once we actually decreased, increased the resistance value, the current decreased. And in that case, my input electrical energy was less than the ohmic loss. So the excess of ohmic loss came from decrease in the stored energy. Here, we didn't change the resistance, but we had a motion instead. So the decrease in the stored magnetic energy actually came from the magnetic energies 
the decrease in the magnetic energy stored inside my ferromagnetic material. So here we see that the magnetic energy was actually converted into some kind of motion, mechanical energy and that's why we call it as electromechanical energy conversion and this here again with the help of all these areas we can analyze it that's what is being done here on page number 110 and then we come to the last kind of emotion which is the transient motion so in case of a transient motion we assume neither a slow movement of the plunger nor a very fast extremely fast movement but something in between so if we have something in between then as the plunger moves neither is our current going to remain constant nor is our flux leakage going to remain constant so our operating point will go from A to B A to C I'm sorry as shown here in figure 3.17 so let me just take a bigger version of this figure so from A, the operating point moves from A to C when the plunger moves okay and when we let the plunger in the closed position long enough the current would eventually rise and come to I1 but the transition from the blue curve to the red curve is not a line parallel to the y-axis nor is it a line parallel to the x-axis but it's a line which has a certain slope the line from A to C so this represents the transient motion and whatever shaded area that we have is actually equal to the work done on the system so this is also analyze here and then we can do all the analysis and find out the mechanical energy in terms of the area enclosed by these two curves so what we have seen here is a graphical method for calculating the force acting on the plunger or the work done by the plunger however in actual systems we will not be able to do this kind of a graphical analysis so to simplify that what we do is actually we go back to our system of equations so the force acting on the plunger was given by equation 3.26 this equation which, is, which we have seen something very carefully and using the analogy of the slow motion transient motion and instantaneous motion we can actually simplify this equation 3.26 further and that's what we are going to do now so let's assume that initially our plunger was at some initial position shown by the black line in figure 3.18 so I have a larger version of the figure for you on the screen so you can see here there's an initial position and we assume that the plunger moves by a very small distance dx okay and that is shown by initial position plus dx so now the motion from initial position to initial position plus dx is actually some kind of a transient motion so if we look very carefully the operating point will change from a to B as shown by the arrow from A to B okay that's the transient motion here now if we make an assumption and the assumption is that we assume that instead of the operating point moving from A to B we assume it to move it to C okay that means if we go from initial position to initial position plus DX we assume actually the operating point has moved to B but in our analysis we assume it to move to C okay so what we do we are assuming that the plunger moves from one position to the other position or makes this DX displacement at a constant current okay and if we do that then we are going to introduce an error and the error in our calculation would be equal to the area A B C fine now if we assume that this dx is extremely small then the area ABC will also tend to zero okay so for extremely small displacements we can assume that in the plungers operating point instead of going to B goes to C so we can say that the motion has taken place at constant current similarly we can also assume that the operating points does not go from A to B but goes from A to D so if we do that kind of an assumption then we would introduce an error which will be equal to the area A B D 
again if we assume the displacement to be extremely small then this area a b d can be made very very small okay and then we can assume that the plunger goes from uh, or plunger makes a displacement of dx at constant lambda clear so these are the two possibilities that we can make assuming that the plunger makes a very small displacement and that is true for most of the cases because the movement is not in discrete steps rather the movement is a continuum whenever a rotor rotates in a machine the movement is not in discrete step it's a continuous rotation okay if we have a stepper motor that's a different case it goes from one angle to the other angle and the motion is rather discrete but for an induction motor or a synchronous motor or a DC motor the movement is continuous so we can assume that movement to be extremely small so if we assume the movement to be extremely small then we can make this next make the next assumption that the movement has taken place at constant current or at constant flux so if we do that kind of an analysis then we can say that the force acting on my plunger is minus dw fld by dx that means minus rate of change of field energy okay and this actually has come from the simplification of equation 3.26 if I assume that my motion has taken place at constant lambda okay so my first term in equation 3.26 partial derivative of lambda with respect to x would be equal to 0 and what would I be left with my force acting on the plunger is minus the rate of change of field energy and to be more mathematically precise we say it is minus rate of field change of field energy at constant lambda that means we have to consider the lambda or the flux linkage to be constant so if the motion takes place at a constant flux linkage then my field force acting on the plunger is given by minus the rate of change of field energy with respect to x and equation 3.48 <clears throat> I will just make it bigger for you for your ease equation 3.48 actually shows the actual proper mathematical expression for the field energy okay and the field energy itself can be given by equation 3.49 which is half lambda square by LX okay L if uh, inductance as a function of X and if we do all kinds of substitution I can represent my force as lambda square into 1 by 2 divided by inductance square into rate of change of inductance okay and I can represent my lambda as L into I and I can finally have my force equation as half I square into rate of change of inductance with respect to position so this is what we have this is the simplified form of the force acting on the system that we were analyzing and here yeah we have <coughs> another box and this box actually explains further mathematical tricks in detail so one can actually go through the box later on and then we have the example again so this example explains the use of all the principles that we have discussed so I don't think so we will have much time left to uh, discuss the example so we will now go to the next part which is about calculating the force using the co-energy okay so co-energy 